Okay, this is going to be a video about the GCOM A7. I'm going to go ahead and open up the machine and take a look inside. Take a look at the cooler inside, and I'm going to post some data down below. I'm not going to cover everything in detail too much, but the rubber feet here are, well, they've got adhesives and small little clips there, so it takes a little bit of effort to actually get them out the first time, so using, like, tweezers to scoop them out, and sometimes you kind of have to dig it into the thing a little bit, it pops right out. So once those feet are removed, you need to take a screwdriver, remove the four screws, open up the machine. Um, Oh, maybe if this is the first time you've, you're seeing the GCOM A7, it's a really small um, Nook size mini PC. It's a lot truer to the Nook size than a lot of newer machines from like B-Link or Mini's form. So GCOM's falling in that size. Got decent I.O. Um, these USB-C ports do not run on 100 watt USB-C PD power, unfortunately. But you do get an SD card reader, which I think is nice. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and open this up. And one of the weird things that I have noticed about this unit is that uh, because it has a 7940HS AMD processor with a 780M iGPU, it runs on DDR5. All the new AMD processors from 6000 and newer run on DDR5. And unfortunately, because there is only cooling on the upper half of the mini PC and nothing underneath to keep the computer so small, uh, the RAM does thermal throttle. It reaches about 80 degrees Celsius relatively quickly and spikes if I run synthetic tests a few times. And because of that, the RAM temperatures gradually creep up on average to about 70 to 80 degrees Celsius. It gets really hot. Uh, RAM thermal throttles, DDR5 in particular, because we can... They include a temperature sensor, and we can monitor it. it. Reaches about 80 degrees Celsius, and it starts thermal throttling. That's not great. But any temperature below that typically is much better. So this cap doesn't have like a pull tab or anything, but it just comes off a little bit, and you just want to be real delicate here because there is an antenna wire that we don't want to tear. But the cover can just go off to the side. Screwdriver... This is using a pH zero bit and just unscrewing that additional plate. And this plate acts as a heatsink for the SSD. The SSD temperatures are reasonably fine because you got this metal chunk that acts as a heatsink. That's okay. Um, but unfortunately, for the RAM, it just cooks in there because there's nothing actively cooling it down. All right, nice short screws. And what I've noticed is if I start running 3D marked um, tests like Time Spy, Fire Strike, and Night Raid, because these tests typically take about five or ten minutes five, six minutes or something like that uh, per test. The first five minutes, the test and the scores are pretty good because the RAM doesn't thermal throttle. Here's the cover. It's got a little bit of a light cap here for the LEDs. And there's no thermal throttling for the first test, but then as I run two, three, four tests and then to the total five tests, I'm seeing the performance drop sometimes like by 20%, and it's just like... This RAM here, even though it's nice, crucial, branded RAM and 5600 megahertz, it's not 1.2 volts, 1.1 volts. Unfortunately, the RAM does thermal throttle. And that causes the rest of the machine to thermal throttle. The CPU performance, otherwise, in short bursty loads, is great. It competes itself with um, larger machines like the B-Link GTR7 Pro, even though the machine's almost twice the size and it's got a much larger cooler, the performance is uh, pretty close in short bursts. But unfortunately, as those tests kind of run more and more, the temperature does catch up. Oop. Um, 
we're gonna see if this fits. Nope, 4.5 is a no go. Let's see if it's five. Five millimeters it is. I'm gonna go ahead and use a socket bit here. to remove these screw headers. And I wanna take a look at this cooler here before I move on with modifications. Actually, I probably should remove the SSD and wireless card, but we'll just remove these screw standoffs. Make sure when you are tightening these screw standoffs to reinstall them, that they are nice and firm because you don't want to be accidentally unscrewing them in the future when you're trying to ac access these standoffs when you're uh, screwing and unscrewing this additional plate on top. Otherwise you'll be getting yourself a little bit stuck. Alrighty. Four screws. I like the four screws idea. Keeps it relatively simple. The, there are many PCs like the GT, B Link GTI 14 Ultra where there's like dozens of screws inside. Like, that's too much. All right. Four identical standoffs. Grab this last one. There we go. Keep your screws and standoffs grouped together and just off to the side. Disconnect the socket. And pH zero screw bit works just well enough for these M.2 screws. I'm going to remove this SSD and well, for those of you curious, this is what the branded N7000 SSD that's inside from Acer. It's not a conventional SSD that I normally see but let's see warranty void if any label or screw is removed oh there you go that's more information i believe this is a gen 4 ssd but i could if there's any interesting information it's not one of those uh prime branded uh crucial or let's see who makes it Good SSDs. SK Hynix, Samsung, Western Digital. It's none of those. Alright, that socket needs to come out to remove the wireless card. M5 does work for that. Um, the antennas are kept in place with this uh, plastic piece of acrylic sticker. I'm just gonna disconnect that, keep that out of the way. The one antenna is still connected down to the base of the case. I do want to access that so I can remove it if necessary. And the main board just slides out from the side like this. Huh. That is, this is definitely one of the more easier main boards to remove. So good on GCOM for keeping it straightforward. Let's see if I can get this out of here. Last thing I want to do is tear the antenna by accident, but uh, there we go. Slides out just like that. Okay, so here is the cooler inside. We have an 80 by 10 millimeter five volt fan that is the fan spec if you need to find a replacement it's reasonably beefy um, and we can see underneath there are heat pipes some nylon electric tape and i believe this is copper black coated fins i don't think it's aluminum nickel plated so I don't know what this is. It's not the usual copper. It's very light. The heat pipes are definitely copper. I'm going to go ahead and disconnect the fan. 
and take a look inside. Regularly, the fan does allow the CPU to get pretty hot, like around 80 to 90 degrees Celsius easily from short bursty loads. So this is like what I would essentially consider the bare minimum for cooling for an H series processor like the 7940HS that's in this GCOM A7. And from what I understand, this should be almost identical to the A8 series where it's got the 8945HS and 8845HS since it's essentially just a refresh of the same processor with an improved AI. This is the more simpler version, much more cost effective. And the fan just tilts right out. I'll give GCOM credit here. It's very easy to disassemble this computer. That is a relief. Lots of fins on the fan. That looks good. Um, doesn't have like a high pitched scream because there's so many fans trying to scoop up air. I don't know, but yeah. I don't see an exact uh, fill port. There might be one. If I peel up the sticker, there might be, but for other people that are looking to lubricate this fan uh, to help reduce noise or in the far future, chances are good you're probably going to have to disassemble this fan by breaking these clips, peeling off the top plate, and then popping off the top fan thing to reach the bearing inside. At the moment, I'm not too eager to do that. I assume, just from experience, that this is as the system was intended. The fan noise, there, there isn't too much that can be done to fix it. It's got two heat pipes here that just wrap around. And this, I assume, is the area around where the VRMs are. And we can see the mounting of the CPU with those four um, screws. Well, I may as well measure the thing. Let's take a look. CMOS battery, if you ever need to reset the thing, um, you'll have to disassemble the computer and physically, or no, physically open the computer and disconnect this red wire here to reset the BIOS if you ever need to reset it. Just disconnect it for 30 seconds, reconnect it, and it will reset the BIOS to its defaults. But hey, let's take a look. What are the CPU mounting requirements for this? If you are looking to build a custom cooler for the A7 or A8 from GCOM, 37.6 millimeters is about the center from screw to screw. That's the same for both the front and back. And then if we look at this from the side, not precise here, but close enough. About 50.5 millimeters. I'm tempted to just say it's 50. Let me see if I adjust that to 50. Uh, there we go. Yeah, 50 millimeters by 37.5. Yeah, 37.5 by 50 millimeters are the screw mounting holes. And you'll want to elevate that mounting, well, about four millimeters. No, it's 3.8. Maybe 3.75 or 3.5 if you want to be a little bit extra cautious. I think it's really curious to see. Nope, they've got thermal paste underneath there. I'm not going to open this up because I don't want to repaste it. It's got thermal pads directly underneath here where the VRMs would be. And what in the world is protecting? Oh, that's just the wire. They've just got the electrical tape there to hold the wire in place. That's fine, that can stay. But yeah, thermal pads are under here. This is a very, very small heat sink um, or contact pad for the die. I know you don't really need that much, but I would have liked to see way more metal here just for, to help with a little bit more additional heat transfer. That would have been nice. And these two heat pipes, while appreciated, I think GCOM could possibly have uh, spread out and squeezed in a third heat pipe. Now, where would that go exactly? I'm not sure. I'm trying to think of ways how GCOM could have added more cooling 
they've really squeezed in most of what they could in such a small board. Hmm. I guess additionally, if they really wanted to, they could break out a little bit more cooling and radiators out to these corners right about here. But that would be super custom and very expensive to do. I think just GCOM really has to use U-series processors rather than the HS-series processors because these main boards are very toasty compared to just the slightly larger um, units that it's competing with. But it's a nice main board. It would be nice to see this being sold as is. And, yeah, it's cool. Oh, and before I forget, there are USB headers on the inside of this main board. We got a USB 2.0 header here and another USB 2.0 header here. The far left uh, is positive 5 volts and ground is on the uh, far right. Uh, that's the same over here. Left is positive and ground on the far right. I don't know if which one is data positive and negative for the two middle pins, but you do, you can mix those up and there will be no harm for the computer. But yeah, I do plan on using those internal 5 volts uh, pins for a internal fan header, so I'm going to go give that a go. I would have really liked to see an additional M.2 storage slot here. This could have fit a 2242 storage drive that that would have been fantastic for such a compact machine for additional storage because you only get that one ssd slot but yeah what else can be done oh there's also like a com port header over here and some other speaker pads here i i don't know what that could be used for but it's fascinating that it's there if you wanted to build like internal uh, speaker io i would assume one of them is your speaker right and then ground and then the other one on the left would be speaker left and ground but what controller that leads to i'm not really sure okay so yep that's a look inside the gcom a7 i hope this was informative for anybody that was curious yeah very small very easy to get to oh right and the uh, wireless card now oh, this is a very unique card so if anybody wants to look that up, it's an AWXB691NF. I don't really know. <laughs> I did run some Wi-Fi tests here, and I did not have issues with it. Um, it does have relatively small antenna pads. As you can see, one antenna pad is just tiny and stuck inside the corner, and the other on the top plastic case. So, yeah. I would have liked seeing larger antenna pads, especially like just huge giant chunks over here, but or even just antenna ears for even longer wireless range. But this works. It, it works. It's just not infinite range. I know a lot of people have wi wireless things and they want that infinite range. But it's an interesting mainboard. GCOM's A7-7940HS. Hmm. All right. Yeah, let's have a good one.